on World News Tonight. Migration Deal Australia and India signed a migration deal seeking greater heights in relations. End of conflict? Is the Armenian head of state accepting the fact that the nagorno karabakh enclave is a part of Azerbaijan? What's the international response? Find out tonight. Trump's challenger. Ron DeSantis is soon set to announce his entrance into the United States 2024 presidential race, probing more internal conflict in the Republican Party. And it's a Barbie cafe. New Yorkers flock to witness a pop-up Malibu Barbie Queen cafe spreading the wonders of food, coffee and colour to all around. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are joining us on World News as we keep you up to date with the latest around the world. Now, starting tonight is on how India's Prime Minister made a grand entry in Sydney. India and Australia have announced a migration deal as they aim to strengthen their economic cooperation. And this comes as tens of thousands of overseas Indians cheered in support of the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at a rally in Sydney's biggest sporting arena, a rama showing for a foreign leader in Australia. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese met Narendra Modi, his Indian counterpart in Sydney, to discuss regional security and economic ties and signed a migration deal to boost Indian student and business travel to Australia. The announcement came after both leaders met in Sydney. The deal aims to promote the two-way mobility of students, graduates, academic researchers and business people. They also discuss regional security amid rising tensions in the region. This is Prime Minister Modi's first visit to Australia since 2014 and comes two months after PM Albanese visited India in March. Negotiations for the migration agreement had been ongoing for a couple of years. Australia already has a significant number of people who have migrated from India. Census data shows that more than a million people who moved to Australia since 2016, almost a quarter were from India. According to a statement, the finalized migration agreement will also lead to the creation of a new scheme called MITS, which stands for Mobility Arrangement for Talented Early professional scheme, which has been specifically created for India. The Indian Prime Minister said that the two countries has also been discussing increasing cooperation on mining and critical minerals and made progress in establishing an Australian-India Green Hydrogen Task Force. India and Australia are also working towards a comprehensive economic cooperation deal for which negotiations began more than a decade ago. Thousands of people from the country's Indian diaspora has turned up to one of Sydney's biggest indoor stadiums where Prime Minister Modi was speaking at a rally. Narendra Modi, who is visiting Australia for the first time since 2014, is looking to use his popularity amongst expatriate Indians to boost support at home ahead of a general election next year after his ruling Bharatiya Janata Party lost a key state election in southern India this month. France formally banned domestic flights on short routes that can be covered by trains in less than two and a half hours, a move aimed at reducing airline emissions that has also irked the industry. Although the measure was included in the 2021 climate law and already applied in practice, some airlines had asked the European Commission to investigate whether it was legal. The change will mostly rule out air trips between Paris, regional hubs such as Nantes, Lyon and Bordeaux, with connecting flights un. Affected. Critics have noted that the cutoff point for comparable train journeys in shy of the roughly three hours it takes to travel from Paris to Mediterranean port city Marseille by high speed rail. The law does specify that the train service on the same route must be frequent, timely, and well connected enough to meet the needs of passengers who would otherwise travel by air and able to absorb the increase in passenger numbers. Yevgeny Prigozhin over the weekend delivered Vladimir Putin one of the few battlefield victories of the president's 15-month war in Ukraine. Even then, Russia's most powerful mercenary could not resist breaking the taboos of Putin's tightly controlled political system. Bakhmut. As Yevgeny Prigozhin announced the fall of the destroyed Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, Russia's most powerful mercenary appeared to hand its president a rare battlefield victory. Yes, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The founder of the Wagner Group thanked Vladimir Putin for the opportunity to defend the motherland. But he couldn't resist breaking some taboos. In Bakhmut, we were not only fighting the armed forces of Ukraine, 
bureaucracy. We were fighting the Russian bureaucracy, he said, specifically naming and shaming Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Chief of the General Staff Valery Gerasimov. Shoigu! Gerasimov! Where are it comes after earlier this month he used a profanity-laden video to criticize the two, accusing them of allowing five times more men to die than was necessary. But this kind of speech is dangerous in Putin's tightly controlled political system. Public criticism of the war isn't tolerated. So how does Prigozhin get away with it? Officials, diplomats and analysts told that he's likely acting with the tacit approval of those dismayed by the military's war conduct. Sources diverge on how to interpret his actions. A Russian source said he represents one side in a struggle within Putin's system. A former FSB officer said Prigozhin's verbal lobs towards the defense ministry are the result of contradictions that have come out within the ruling clan. He suggested it could mark the beginning of a struggle for life after Putin. But one Western diplomat told Prigozhin would likely make for a weak potential rebel as he doesn't have an independent logistic capacity. With an election looming next year, it's unclear how long Putin will tolerate the open war of words. State television ignored the apparent fall of Bakhmut for 20 hours. It took the Kremlin 10 to put out a terse, congratulatory statement. And it didn't name Prigozhin. For his part, Prigozhin said he'd hand Bakhmut over to the Russian army by June. Prigozhin, the Kremlin, and the defense ministry did not respond to requests seeking comment. Now, cutting off to the election race in the United States, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, whose impassioned battles over pandemic lockdowns and divisive cultural issues have endeared him to conservatives, and he will be announcing that he is seeking the Republican presidential nomination. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will announce he is seeking the Republican presidential nomination on Wednesday, placing him on a collision course with former U.S. President Donald Trump. DeSantis's political team has confirmed he will make the announcement on Twitter during a discussion with the social media company's CEO, Elon Musk, where he will also file a document with the Federal Election Commission declaring his candidacy. You have this lack of trust in the medical establishment. DeSantis, whose impassioned battles over pandemic lockdowns and divisive cultural issues have endeared him to conservatives, was handily re-elected to a second term as Florida's governor in November. His rising profile among Republicans and fundraising prowess likely makes him the biggest threat to Trump's hopes of once again winning the Republican nomination for the White House. You know, a corporatist would say that you have to give Disney everything at once. Well, in reality, uh, Disney was enjoying unprecedented privileges and subsidies. DeSantis has rebuffed critics, pushed his priorities through the legislature, and punished his enemies, picking a high-profile fight with Disney one of Florida's biggest employers. But if DeSantis hopes to defeat Trump, he will ultimately have to bring every possible anti-Trump voter he can into the fold. And even that might not be enough. The two men were close allies during Trump's four years in the White House. Trump endorsed him during his first campaign for governor. But as DeSantis' fortunes continue to rise after Trump left office, the former president's mood toward the governor turned sour. Trump has pilloried DeSantis' record as a governor and dubbed him Ron DeSanctimonious. DeSantis, in turn, will have to paint Trump as a candidate who cannot win a general election against Democratic President Joe Biden. He will have to win over Republicans turned off by Trump. DeSantis enters a fractured field, facing rivals such as Nikki Haley, Trump's former ambassador to the United Nations, and Tim Scott, a U.S. senator from South Carolina. Still in the United States, former President Donald Trump will face a criminal trial on the 25th of March in 2024 over charges accusing him of falsifying business records to conceal money paid to silence adult actor Stormy Daniels. Donald Trump appeared remotely in a Manhattan courtroom Tuesday, where the judge set a date of March 25th, 2024 for the former president's criminal trial and warned him not to disclose evidence in advance. Trump is charged with falsifying business records to conceal money paid to silence porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of his 2016 presidential election. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 criminal counts in the case.
At least four screens in the courtroom showed Trump wearing a striped red tie and blue suit, sitting next to his lawyer in front of a background of U.S. flags. Trump's attorney told Justice Juan Marchand that Trump understood he could not disclose certain evidence, including witness statements, to third parties such as news outlets or on social media. Prosecutors have said the order was needed because of Trump's history of attacks on social media and the risk that witnesses might be harassed. But the frontrunner for the Republican nomination for president in the 2024 election remains free to speak about most evidence in the case, which comes from the defense. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, millions of acres of land have been destroyed in Alberta as the fire spreads even more. Crews hope that wet weather could be the turning point after the worst start of the fire season on record. However, officials say that the province will remain on high alert despite rainfall and cooler temperatures offering some relief. The raging wildfires in western Canada have wiped out more than 2 million acres of land in Alberta, an area about half the size of Lake Ontario. It's a grim toll from what's turning out to be one of the area's worst wildfire seasons on record, triggered by record high temperatures and low rainfall. Alberta wildfire official Christy Tucker said on Tuesday help will soon arrive from Australian and New Zealand firefighters, set to join the few thousand already fighting the blaze. There are 1,123 firefighters from across Canada and the United States assisting nearly 1,700 from Alberta wildfire on these fires. We're working closely with the municipal fire departments who are also protecting their own communities. Even though we have made headway on many wildfires on the landscape, we know that the season is far from over. We need to be prepared. Officials say the province will remain on high alert despite rainfall and cooler temperatures offering some relief. We're hoping the weather continues to assist in the fight against these wildfires. Alberta continues to be under a provincial state of emergency and the Provincial Emergency Coordination Centre remains at a level four. The widespread fires were sparked by high heat and a lack of rain in Alberta this year, forcing tens of thousands of people out of their homes. According to Alberta's Wildfire Information Unit, the damage so far is already a several thousand fold increase from last year. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan says that his country is prepared to officially recognize the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. The ethnic Armenian enclave located within Azerbaijan has for decades been a source of conflict between the two Caucasus neighbors, sparking two wars, the most recent of which broke out in 2020. Under mounting pressure, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan announced Monday, not for the first time, a willingness to recognize Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's territory includes Nagorno-Karabakh, but the issue of the rights and safety of Nagorno-Karabakh's Armenians should be discussed between Baku and Stepanakert. Stepanakert is the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, a self-governing enclave of ethnic Armenians located within Azerbaijan that has been the focus of a decades-long conflict. A six-week war in 2020 saw Azerbaijan rout Armenian forces to regain control of large swaths of territory around the region's edges before a truce was declared. Recent months have seen tensions once again coming to a head as Azerbaijani activists have blockaded Nagorno-Karabakh's only land link with Armenia, the Lashin Corridor, for over five months, cutting off food, medical and military supplies, with Azerbaijani forces even setting up a checkpoint, contrary to the 2020 truce. Meanwhile, near daily border clashes have proved deadly for heavily outgunned Armenian forces. Azerbaijan's strongman, President Ilham Aliyev, with the upper hand, is seeking to cement his gains, the threat of a return to war still on the table. We believe that a peace agreement between our two countries is inevitable. We're doing our utmost to achieve it. 
Both former Soviet republics, Azerbaijan is now backed militarily by Turkey, while Armenia is a member of the Russian-led CSTO military bloc. With Russia focused on its grinding war in Ukraine, Moscow has been loath to antagonize its key economic partner, Turkey, leading to frustration in Armenia over what it sees as insufficient Russian support, Pashinyan floating the possibility of dropping out of the CSTO bloc altogether. Pashinyan and Aliyev are scheduled to meet Thursday for peace talks hosted by Vladimir Putin in Moscow. A volcano around 45 miles southeast of the Moscow city has been showing increasing signs of activity in recent days, leading the, uh, leading the Mexican government to close schools in dozens of municipalities across three states and hold drills for the possibility of evacuations. It's the sounds nobody wants to hear, but if they do, they'll all have to flee. For now, though, towns like Santiago Chalicintla are holding drills in the events that Popocatépetl becomes increasingly active. As over the past days, it's been throwing gas, ash and rock into the air. Many are choosing to wear face masks again to protect themselves from the ashes, and dozens of schools have been closed as shelters are opened. It was very active last night. It was rumbling, it was spewing a lot of ash, and it was almost on fire. And while it may seem like a lot of preparation for a volcano that hasn't erupted in over a thousand years, with 25 million people living within a 100 kilometer radius, including in the capital Mexico City, Popocatépetl is deemed a real threat. Known locally as El Popo, it woke up again in 1994 and since then has become increasingly active. Its ashes are now coating the towns and the fields. This is normally the time when the grass and everything is growing, but we're not able to go and work in the fields because of the ash. The government has set the alert level at three, one below the evacuation warning. More movements have been detected at North Korea's Sohio satellite launching site where the North could launch its first spy satellite. Experts say that the launch may be on the way in the near future. This is a satellite imagery of North Korea's Sohe satellite launching site taken this past Monday. According to an analysis from Radio Free Asia, the image shows a new facility being built, which is believed to be the launch pad from where the North's first ever military reconnaissance satellite will be launched. Comparing satellite images of the same location from a week earlier shows that construction at the site is progressing rapidly, and North Korea may be quickly moving towards launching the satellite soon. And experts say it may be just a matter of North Korea looking for the best weather conditions to go ahead with the satellite launch. The Sahe satellite launching ground is located on the country's western coast in Tongchangni, North Pyongyang province near the Chinese border. The site is the North's only known permanent operational test ground for major weapon systems, which includes intercontinental ballistic missiles. Meanwhile, other satellite images show that North Korea is preparing for a massive military parade to mark the 70th anniversary of Armistice Day, which the regime often calls its Victory Day. Four troop formations were seen moving to the medium airfield in Pyongyang, a military training ground in the capital. Voice of America says that while between 200 and 1,200 troops were seen in the recent images, that number could increase further as it gets closer to the anniversary day on July 27th. With North Korea potentially showcasing its latest weapons during the military parade and a spy satellite launch looming, watchers say the tensions on the Korean Peninsula will continue to rise with little chance of dialogue between the two Koreas. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea holds their breath for a successful launch of Nori, which is a three-stage launch vehicle. Nori is the first indigenously developed South Korean orbital launch vehicle. Residents of Guam race for a Typhoon Mauer, a massive storm that meteorologists predict will be one of the most brutal to hit the region in decades. A deadly epidemic that is spreading through the Red Sea has killed off the entire species of sea urchin in Israel's Gulf of Elat, imperiling the region's uniquely resilient coral reefs. Aston Martin Aramco Cognizant 
F1 team is on board with Honda and will take on this new challenge together. During this project, Aston Martin will design, develop and manufacture the car's frame as well as manage the team's operation. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been referred to police by the government's cabinet office over new allegations he broke lockdown rules during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that wraps up tonight's edition of World News. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with New Yorkers flocking up a pop-up Malibu Barbie Cafe and enjoying childhood dreams of the pink world. Stay safe and have a good night.